through the hall. And then, as Pat mentioned, we are, uh, we are known as a world-class orchestra. And what does world-class mean, and what does it take to be a world-class orchestra? So I'd like to talk about that a little bit. Now, I'll be done by midnight, is that OK? <laughs> uh, a couple little things. Uh, I gather your usual practice is to have the speaker and then some time for questions afterwards. And we're more than happy to do that. However, I'd like to say it doesn't bother me a bit if I've said something that isn't clear or you need clarification of something as we go along. Don't be afraid you know, to raise your hand and speak up. Uh, interruptions uh, don't really bother me that much. Uh, you might not want to, if you have something that's totally unrelated, you might want to hold that to the end. But <laughs> as we go along, if there's something I say that's not clear or you want a little more information, why well, speak to me about that and, and we'll try to answer that. And I already have a question. Uh, not, not a question, just to mention that I'm a retired member of the Pittsburgh Symphony. Just, I'm checking up on you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so you much, keep John. You honest then, right? <laughs> Thanks for Thanks the so, Thank you so I much. I thought I recognized you, but I couldn't say for sure. We all change a little bit as years go, as years go by. Another thing I want to say is uh, at the end, when we're doing the questions, we're going to pass out a little slip of paper. We're going to ask you to put your name and address on that. And we will gather those up and have a drawing. I have two free tickets to the symphony. So somebody in the room tonight is going to go home. Well, actually, it's a voucher for two free tickets, OK? You'll have to call and make arrangements to get the tickets for the night for the concert you want. And there are still a number of concerts left this year that you can uh, pick from. So we have that as a little gift at the end for, for having me. Well, Pittsburgh Symphony, when did it start? It started actually in 1895. It was, it was uh, organized as the Pittsburgh Arts Society. A group of local uh, musicians got together. Uh, they found a man by the name of Frederick Archer. Uh, that was the year that uh, Carnegie Music Hall was built, actually, was completed in 1895. And they were one of the first people to perform there. And they went to Carnegie Hall. Carnegie Hall holds about 1,950 people. It's out here in Oakland, as I'm sure you're all familiar with. And they started playing as a symphony. Uh, it was pretty much a local organization, kind of a, you know, people from the Pittsburgh area that got together that were good players and started playing orchestra together, playing orchestra things together. And that went on for about three years. And they got so good, they decided they better hire some really well-known good conductor. And they went out and they hired, of all people, Victor Herbert. Now, you've probably heard of Victor Herbert. Uh, Victor Herbert was a, primarily a composer, did a lot of comic opera, kind of light stuff. Uh, more what we would call today pops kind of stuff. But nonetheless, he was uh, hired as the symphony's conductor. Uh, he was kind of a flamboyant sort of guy. Uh, people liked him, uh, except the critics didn't like him very well because he was a little too showmanship. It was too much showmanship and not <coughs> seriousness. And the people who went to the symphony were primarily moneyed people in those days, and they were a little more, I don't know what the word would be, dignified or something. And they, they weren't sure they liked Victor Herbert. And the critics didn't like him because they thought he wasn't such a good musician. He spent too much time, you know, with the theatrics and making things uh, interesting for the people. The only problem was, and it's a problem in reverse, people loved, people loved him, the, the, the public loved him. So they showed up for the concerts and the, places, the place was packed. Every time the symphony played, it was packed. Critics could never understand that, but uh, the people loved him. So he was here for a number of years, to 1904, as a matter of fact, and an Austrian came in by the name of Emil Power. Now, Emil was a totally different guy than Victor Herbert, kind of the exact opposite. He was a very intellectual sort of guy, a very fine musician, accomplished musician, serious sort of guy. He got lavish praises from the critics, of course. Uh, <clears throat> the musicians were not too sure they liked him. <laughs> The audience were not too sure they liked him, but uh, nonetheless, he was very good. One of the things he did was he started hiring musicians from Europe. 
and he kept replacing American musicians with European musicians. And that didn't sit too well with the orchestra. In fact, it got so bad that one year the musicians in the orchestra announced that they would not renew their contract for next year. About half of them made that pronouncement. That if he continued to bring in foreign musicians, they would not play the next year. Also, the man who was the president of the National Federation of Musicians sent a letter to power, and he said, if you continue to do this practice of bringing in these people from overseas and not hiring Americans, I'm going to instruct the musicians to not show up for rehearsals or performances, and you'll have no orchestra. And uh, so power had to sort of change his ways. Well, about this same time, in the early 1900s, and I'm really not too wise about this, maybe some of you are, but about 1907, there was some kind of a, a financial decline in the world market. Not the depression that we experienced here in the 1930s, but earlier than that, it was a, a outside the United States, and a lot of the people that supported the orchestra, who had their money invested in overseas type investments, started having their investments go down, like many of us did a couple of years ago in the United States. And the support to the orchestra dropped off. And then there was this problem with the conductor, and the musicians were not happy, and there was all these kind of problems going on. People started to not buy tickets to the orchestra anymore, and it just got in real big trouble. And the board of directors decided, well, if they could get $50,000 together as an endowment, that would be enough. The, in, the income off of that $50,000 endowment would keep the orchestra going. Now, you know, those numbers are kind of pathetic to us today. I mean, you, know, you almost have to have 50 million today, not 50,000. But, but uh, in those days, that would have been a lot of money, and that would have kept the orchestra going. So they had a big campaign, tried to get enough money together, $50,000, to put it in endowment to maintain the orchestra. Well, they didn't make it. They got something like fifteen or maybe eighteen thousand dollars is what all they got. So the orchestra was disbanded. Nineteen ten, uh, the orchestra was done, and it was done for sixteen years. Nothing happened for sixteen years. So from nineteen ten to nineteen twenty six, Pittsburgh did not have a symphony at all. In nineteen twenty six, uh, a bunch of local people, musicians again, got together and decided they really needed a Pittsburgh Symphony. And they decided that they would give of their time, and they would rehearse 14 times. Now, by today's standards, that's a lot of rehearsals, for, particularly for one concert, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. By the way, I might say, I'll interject that about a little bit later right now. When I was talking about questions, if you have a question and I tell you the answer is, well, I'll talk about that a little later, you know, that's a public speaker's trick. That means he doesn't know the answer. <laughs> and he hopes that you'll forget it, you know, and he'll forget it. So if, if I say that's later, you'll know I don't know the answer. Right? But we will talk about some of these things a little bit later, too. But anyhow, these people got together. They had 14 rehearsals. They all chipped in $25 each. Now, again, think about this. This is 1926, so $25 was quite a bit of money, actually and they decided they would give a free concert. They managed to get a man by the name of Elias Breeskin, local man, to be the conductor. They went to uh, Siri Mosque. Siri Mosque had been built in 1915, so it was about 11 years old at that point, and they held a Sunday afternoon concert. It was held on Sunday, April the 24th, 1927, was by the time they got this thing together. Well, interestingly, the Blue House in Pennsylvania said, no secular music on Sunday. So on Monday, all of the board members of the orchestra were arrested and taken to jail <laughs> because the symphony had played Sunday afternoon. Well, that just caused a big outcry in the city. Uh, everybody was upset about that, and they had to release them from jail. And it was probably the best publicity that they could possibly get. So they started having regular Sunday afternoon concerts, <laughs> and they filled the place. <laughs> there was just no problem at all. 
So that was, you know, that turned out to be a, a good thing. And I don't know how they got around the blue laws. I really don't know how they did that, but somehow they got around the blue laws and they played and they were very successful. That went on for about three years, and in 1930, they hired a new director, Antonio Monterale. Now, Antonio was a local man. He was born and raised in Braddock. Now, I don't want to sound wrong here, but you know, the people that went to the concerts were kind of, in those days, particularly the upper crust. You know, tuxedos were worn a lot. Not just on opening night, and opening night even now, not everybody wears tuxedos anymore, but in those days, pretty much that was the standard. And they were pretty, pretty high up. And Braddock to them was not such a good place. And they were not happy that this man came from Braddock. The fact that he was a fine musician, you know, that didn't matter. He was from Braddock, and they didn't really <coughs> like him. And he never won the hearts of the, of the local people. But nonetheless, he was a pretty good musician, and he managed to, to stay for a number of years, until, in fact, until 1937. And under him, uh, broadcasts of the symphony were given over the radio, national radio, for the first time. It had always been kind of a local orchestra, and that was really the first introduction to the national scene for the orchestra. They managed to get on radio on a national basis. And in 1937, a name which probably many of you are familiar with, Otto Klemperer was hired as a guest, and he was hired to sort of reorganize things because there had been so much upset with this local man from Braddy. Uh, he was hired to bring in and reorganize the orchestra, put it on a sound basis financially and musically, and get the thing all together. It turns out, according to the records that I have been able to read, and this is hard to believe, in six weeks he managed to turn everything around and get everything in order, and he was here only a year as a guest. He was here for only a year, and at the end of that year, the orchestra was in great shape, and they were getting good audiences, they were playing good music, musically very sound, high level, uh, everything. The finances were in pretty good shape. So in 1938, another name that you're probably all familiar with, Fritz Reiner came, and that's when he arrived in Pittsburgh. Now, Fritz Reiner was a very demanding sort of guy, I'm getting a little head shaking back here. <laughs> um, he was unbelievably demanding, had a volatile temper, didn't have too much of a uh, sense of humor. The story is told, well, back up a second, he, he conducted with a very small beat by that. I mean, you know, he would just, he would just kind of hardly move his hand. And the orchestra members sometimes had a little trouble knowing where he was. And one day, one of the bass players came in with a little telescope. And he's sitting back there in the back. And he put his <laughs> back. And the writer says, what, what are you doing? And he says, I'm trying to see the beat. <laughs> that was the last moment that that man ever played with the Pittsburgh Symphony. He was fired on the spot. That was it. Fritz Brander wouldn't put up with any of that. But nonetheless, the reputation of the orchestra grew dramatically. I mean, it was just unbelievable. He was, he was very fine musically tough to work for, apparently. Um, I'm old enough, believe it or not, uh, well, I'll give you a teaser for you, please. My father took me to concerts when I was young, and I, I actually heard the symphony play under Fritz Reiner back there in those days when, when, he, was, when he was here. And he was here in, actually until 1948, so, you know, that was, I graduated from high school in 1948, so I was at several concerts before I graduated from high school. And one of the things Fritz Reiner did is he brought women into the orchestra. That's the first time women were brought in to the Pittsburgh Orchestra. They had been in other orchestras, but he brought women into the Pittsburgh Orchestra. And he brought in actually 18. Now, that's quite a few. And people were asking him, why did you bring so many women into the orchestra? In fact, we in Pittsburgh had more women in the orchestra than any other major orchestra in the United States. So they were asking Reiner, why did you do this? Now this is a man who didn't have any sense of humor, presumably, but he said, well, it's a lot easier to deal with a group of women than it is to deal with one woman. <laughs> so that was, that was kind of, uh, that was kind of Reiner. 
He was here until 1948. From 48 to 52, there were a series of guest conductors. Uh, and in 52, William Steinberg was employed. Now, if you've ever been to the symphony in years gone by, he was here, you know, until the mid-70s. So he was here for quite a while and uh, was well known. He was born in Germany in 1899. His name, his birth name, was Hans Wilhelm Steinberg. He came to the United States and became known as William because we don't know how to say Wilhelm in the United States or Hans, so we called him William. And again, he kind of reorganized everything in the orchestra, how things were done, where people sat, all kinds of things, and really brought the orchestra up to a very, very high level. In fact, in the first uh, nine years he was here, believe it or not, the first nine years he was here, attendance at concerts improved by 250%. They had, they had two and a half times as many people coming to the concerts as they did when he first came. Where were they playing at this time? Siri Moss. Sorry. Siri Moss. Now, here's one of those things that I'll tell you later. How many seats were in Siri Moss? I have done all kind of research on the internet. And you know what? I can't find that number. There is an implication that it was 4,000. You know. 3,800 is the figure I've heard. 3,800. Well, so the 4,000 is close. Yes. It, it's, it was a big hall. Well, they were filling the hall. In fact, it was the only American orchestra at that time to completely sell out their series with series tickets, uh, season tickets. Uh, if you wanted to go to the concert you know, next month, you couldn't buy a ticket. You couldn't buy a single ticket to a concert because they were all sold out. They were sold out for the whole year and they filled the place. Uh, it was absolutely amazing. And then there was beginnings of talk about carrying Seagram Moss down. Pittsburgh Symphony decided they better find a new home and they started looking for a new home. Uh, they found a piece of ground. The lower hill, about where the Mellon Arena is, in that area, they found some ground there. They hired an architect, they had a building design, and they had contractors bid on this thing. And it turned out to build the building they wanted, to buy the property and build the building they wanted, it was going to be like $40 million. Now this is, you know, this is around in the late 60s. Uh, that was a lot of money. Meanwhile, Heinz Hall, which we'll talk about later, and I promise you I will, it was shut down. It had been shut down in 1964, basically, and it was sitting down there, and it was scheduled to be torn down and turned into a parking lot. Well, some of the people who were involved with the orchestra, plus the Heinz family, thank goodness for the Heinz family, went down and looked at this old building, known as Lowe's Penn Theater in those days, and they decided that would be a great place for the orchestra. So the Heinz Foundation came up with the money to buy the building. $850,000 they bought the building, which was a pretty good buy. However, $10 million later, it was ready to be opened as a performance hall. So they bought it for $850,000, but there was $10 million more. And I remember this is back in 1969-70. It actually opened in September of 71 as a performance hall. And it currently holds 2,661 people when all the seats are in. At that time, it held uh, another 100 or so people because of remodelings, seats have, have, have had to go away. But it was around 2,700. So it was smaller, but as you know, now they perform usually most concerts three times, like a Thursday, Friday night, Sunday afternoon, or Friday, Saturday, and Sunday afternoon, whatever they that, uh, that was for one reason, a uh, very good reason, uh, at Surrey Moss, because it held 3,800, we did two shows, two concerts a week, and when it moved to, uh, it was a smaller venue, so it, they had to uh, 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 do an extra help, help uh, provide more space, so uh, they added an extra concert on. Yeah. Good, thank you. Appreciate yeah. that, yeah. That makes sense. Another thing that happened with that move, which is very interesting and, and, and very unique, actually. The Pittsburgh Symphony actually owns Heinz Hall. 
Most symphony orchestras, I can't give you a percentage, but it's very high. Most symphony orchestras play in a hall where they rent, like they rented Siri Mosque and they rented at the Carnegie Hall, and other orchestras rent wherever they play or <coughs> sign a lease. Uh, Mr. Hines said he didn't like that, and uh, he thought that they ought to own the hall. So the Hines Hall is actually owned by the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra Organization, and uh, they have complete control of that hall. So anything that goes on down there, you know, if you want to use the hall for a performance, you have to rent it from the Pittsburgh Symphony. And again, they can use it as much as they want, because they own it. So three concerts, they didn't have to pay three rents. They own the hall already. And one of the things the Heinz Foundation did, of course, is put some money into an uh, endowment to help maintain the hall over the years, because he was smart enough to realize that maybe there'll be some years that money won't come in, and you need some endowment money back there to pay for that hole to keep it open. So Heinz Hall opened in 1971. We'll talk, I say, a little bit more about that in a few minutes. And in 1976, Andre Trevin came as the conductor. Now, Trevin was somebody who was more into jazz music, uh, more into lighter stuff, but he was nonetheless the conductor and did a good job there. He did a lot of good things for the orchestra. He got, he got a lot of publicity for the orchestra. He started that TV series called Pittsburgh, Previn and the Pittsburgh Ed, Yes, and got a lot of, a lot of uh, publicity out there. People started to hear about the symphony who hadn't heard about it before. People who previously wouldn't come to the orchestra to hear them play because they thought it was too highbrow. People uh, of more moderate income started coming. Uh, the dress code started to relax a little bit. People, more people started coming more everyday kind of people started coming to the orchestra. And so he did really a lot of good in that, in that way for the orchestra. And he was here until 1984 when Lauren Bazell came. Now, interesting, Lauren Bazell was really a local man too. He wasn't born here, but he came here, his parents came here when he was very small, and he actually grew up here in the city. But they accepted him because he was well known. Uh, <laughs> already well known. Mazel was truly uh, a child prodigy, no, no question about it. Give me some numbers here that I have pulled together over the years. At age seven, he was given his first conducting lesson. At age eight, he had his debut as a conductor, believe it or not. At age 11, he was asked to be the guest conductor for the NBC Symphony Orchestra on radio. 11 year old kid, you know. He's conducting the NBC Symphony. At age 12, he toured America and conducted most of the major orchestras on that tour. He was invited to tour. And he was an old man of 15 when he finally soloed as a violinist with an orchestra. He was a very fine violinist. He actually played with the PSO, I guess, when he was in, uh, in college, I guess, about that age. He actually played. And then, he came in 1984 actually as a consultant. They tried to hire him as conductor, but he didn't really want to do that. But he committed to come and be a guest. And he was a guest for about a year and then signed a contract and actually stayed then from, um, from 1984 until 1996. He was here as our conductor. And under Lauren Mazel, uh, the Pittsburgh Symphony gained international attention. Started making European tours. Uh, tours in the United States, uh, the quality of, of the musicians, he was careful about who came into the orchestra, there's a whole process of, of, of people coming into the orchestra which is really tough to get in there, the audition is really tough, but Mazel sort of had the final stamp of approval as I understand in those days, and he made sure who was coming in were good, and the, the whole level of the orchestra just raised, and we started to get international attention as an orchestra. Morris Johnson came in 1906, 1996. He was called, when he came, the most exciting conductor in the world. Now, I'm not sure I know how to interpret that, what that means. But uh, he was known as a very good man. Well, very well known in Europe, came to, came to Pittsburgh. Uh, and everybody liked uh, Morris. Uh, nothing against Lauren Mazel, but he was really a pretty cold sort of guy. Um, Whenever I would do tours, a little personal thing, whenever I would do tours at Heinz Hall, nights of concerts, on the nights that he was conducting, and you would walk backstage, 
the whole atmosphere was different on those nights when Mazel was there than when anybody else was there. It was a lot more quiet. Uh, we weren't supposed, the players weren't supposed to ride in the elevator with him. We knew he was on the elevator, just to for rest. Yeah. Thank the you, yes. Back elevator, yeah. yeah and I, I, have, <laughs> I have heard that story, and I have seen it happen. <laughs> so, <laughs> the backstage elevator, uh, he tended to not come down, of course, to conduct the concert until the very last second. Orchestra would be on stage, tuning up, everything would be ready to go, and then he would come down. He has a suite, the conductor has a suite on the fifth floor backstage. You can down the elevator and come on stage. Uh, Boris Johnson's, on the other hand, when he came, he was down there pretty much all the time. But he just sort of mingled with musicians before the concert, and it was sort of a big party almost. Not quite a party, but very open and lots of, lots of talk and lots of laughter going on backstage before the concert. Well, when Morris had some heart problems, health problems, and uh, he decided he really, he really didn't think he should do Pittsburgh anymore. And uh, he left in 2004, and we had again guest conductors for a year. 2005, the powers that be decided that they would try what was called an innovative model, and they hired three people. They hired Sir Andrew Davis, and they called him the artistic advisor. Uh, Jan Pascal Tortier was hired as the